Okay, colleagues, so let's start our uh, next uh, scientific seminar of uh, Quantum Technology Center of Moscow State University. As I see, it looks like that not all of the participants know Russian, so let's, uh, let's uh, uh, continue in English. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce our next seminar. So next week, we will have a talk uh, from um, uh, Lyubov Mitonova. She is from Amsterdam, and she will talk about computational imaging beyond the Abbey and Nyquist limits. Uh, okay, so it will be next week. And now we have a talk from Polina Sharapova from uh, University of Paderborn about multimode nonlinear SU11 interferometers. Polina, please. Yeah, so thanks. Kostya for kind introduction and uh, thanks for organizing such kind of seminars in this complicated corona stuff. Yeah, so that's really just um, one way to discuss the science. Okay, so let's go from lyrics to physics. And today, yeah, I will talking about um, nonlinear SU11 interferometers. Yeah, perfectly, everything works. Um, about temporal frequency and uh, special properties about integrated versions and anisotropy effects in SU11. And in the end, in uh, last minutes, probably I will talk about a bit um, uh, interaction of such kind of light, which we can generate in the SU11 with uh, atomic and matter systems. So interference. Yeah, so interference, that's a very uh, well-known tool for measurement phase, and you can observe interference uh, everywhere around in nature, not just in optics, but at also in other systems. But when we are talking about quantum optics, optics and quantum optics, uh, our basic element, that's a 50-50 beam splitter, which transmits the light with a 50% and reflect light with a 50% probability. Then, by using beam splitters, we can construct typical linear interferometers. That's a mach sender interferometer, which consists of uh, two beam splitters and some phase in between, input ports, output ports, and everything is linear. Now, let's change the linear uh, material, let's change the beam splitters with a nonlinear medium. And uh, uh, let's keep the all parts are completely the same. Yeah, so in this case, we obtain the nonlinear SU11 interferometer. And um, in this sense, yeah, so we consider as a nonlinear medium, there's a parametric down conversion process you know, where we generate uh, photons to photon signal and ILA from the single pump photon. So in principle, such kind of interferometers have a lot of benefits compared to their linear counterparts that benefits uh, in the phase sensitivity in the losses. Yeah, so for example, uh, nonlinear interferometers are robust to the external losses. And with the nonlinear interferometers, we can overcome the classical bound in phase sensitivity, the short noise limit, uh, which is connected with the best phase sensitivity, which, which can be achievable with the classical light. OK, so uh, now let's talk about a bit squeezing, yeah? So why we have squeezing, why we need it, and so on. So for example, when we look on the um, dependence of the strength of electron electric field on time, we see the typical cosine profile and at different moments of time, we can measure the variance of the field. And this variance depends on the statistic of our light. So for example, when we consider the coherent light, we have the same variance at different moments of time and uh, in the coverture diagram, we have just a circle. Yeah, but when we are talking about squeezed light, then at different moments of time, uh, the variance can be different. Yeah, so at some moments of time, bigger than uh, for coherent light, at some moments of time, smaller. And this is why we have a squeezing in x1 direction or in x2 direction. And this squeezing depends on the squeezing parameter, yeah, so which we can vary with the increase in the strength of our process, for example. Okay, so now what we can say about phase sensitivity of the SU11 interferometers. Uh, so when we are looking in the diagram, uh, when we calculate phase sensitivity for different uh, states, quantum states, classical states, and so on, we can see that there is a classical limit. Now, so the classical limit or so-called short noise limit 
which is scaled like in a one over square root of n, where n that's a number of photons. Yeah, so that's a limit which we can achieve with a classical light or with a coherent light. And that's the best phase sensitivity which we can achieve with a coherent light or classical light. But with a different quantum states of light, we can overcome this bound. Yeah, so in principle, we can even overcome this bound in linear interferometers, but with using some artificial states. Yeah, so with a known state, so we should prepare initially squeeze states and so on. But in the SU11 interferometer, we can achieve this Heisenberg limit. We can overcome the short noise limit and go to the direction of Heisenberg limit, even with a vacuum input yeah, in the end and go to the quantum limit at all. Okay. So now let's talk in about uh, temporal frequency and spatial properties of our um, multi-mode interferometers, non-linear interferometers. And first of all, to compare uh, linear interferometers with uh, non-linear interferometers, yeah, so let's look on the Macht sender interferometer. Let's suppose that we have Macht sender with uh, two beam splitters, and we have uh, in input just a single photon with uh, some temporal profile. And then in the end, we can measure a single count rate or we can measure the coincidence probability in between. So of course, in this case, when we measure the coincidence probability that just zero, we have a single photon. But when we measure the single count rates, they are the same and uh, they include interference, which is scaled with uh, the width, temporal width of our wave packet, initial wave packet of the photon. And uh, from here, we can retrieve the information about the first order coherence. Then we can go further and we can put uh, two photons in the beginning. Then when we will measure the single count rates, that will be just a constant. But in the joint count rate, we'll see the interference, which is now connected with the uh, joint temporal width of the joint wave packet of two photons. Now let's see what's happened when we have a semi-nonlinear interferometer. This means that we change the first beam splitter with a nonlinear media, that's a PDC uh, process here. And then we have just an ordinary beam splitter and that's a typical scheme for observing uh, quantum interference or hongo mandel interference. Yes, and we see here this hongo mandel dip, which is again scaled with the uh, uh, temporal properties of our wave packets here. And finally, when we are looking uh, for the uh, nonlinear interferometer, completely nonlinear interferometer, we see that um, in single count rates and even in the coincidence probability, we have completely the same picture. You know? So we have the same picture with the same interference structure. And this is in principle connected with the fact that photons are generated pairways inside our PDC processes. And so this is in principle the uh, consequence all the strong correlations, photon number correlations between photons. Okay, what we can say about spectral properties of uh, SE11 when uh, we have a rich multimode structure. So let's, for example, consider the case where we have, yeah, so that's our SE11, and we have a group velocity dispersive medium in between. Yeah, so then we generate PDC light in the first crystal then this light will be stretched in the group velocity dispersion medium. And then by varying the time delay between pump and the stretched PDC photon, we can amplify different frequencies in the second crystal. Now, so for example, if our pump overlap with the central frequencies, then we have this amplification of the central frequencies in the end. Now, so that's an experimental setup where you have to be sure that your pump has a different path, yeah, so just not to be stretched as a PDC pulse. And what we see in the end, yeah, so in the end, when we uh, measure and calculate the intensity distribution uh, or the wavelength, we see that in such kind of interferometer, we can create a narrow band single mode light. And this can be achievable only in the high gain regime. Yeah, so in the low gain regime, even with a such kind of configuration with a group velocity dispersion medium, that will be a uh, broad distribution, but in the uh, high gain regime, that's possible. Yeah? So we are sure that that's a high gain regime because you can measure and calculate the second order correlation function and see that that's exactly three. 
Okay, so, but we can go further and we can um, uh, intersect in the second crystal our pump with the other frequencies, yeah, with some sideband frequencies. And it means that we will have amplification of these frequencies and also correlated frequencies. And in the intensity distribution, we will see that we have two correlated peaks at a correlated wavelength. And again, that's possible only in the high gain regime. Yeah? So that's like an unnecessary condition for observation with twin beams in this case. And yeah, so this also can be measured and proved in the experiment. Okay. Then, when we're talking about, uh, talking about um, special properties of SU11, here we can construct um, geometry with a cylindrical symmetry. And if we have a cylindrical symmetry in our SU11, then for some appropriate distances in between, we can generate like in a ring shape intensity distribution. And in this case, we can talk in about generation of light with a non-zero orbital angular momentum. And so for example, when we change the distance between uh, crystals, we see that uh, there is points where we have more or less Gaussian intensity distribution, um, some complicated structures, and also some like in a donut shape where we can generate yeah, so light with non-zero orbital angular momentum and even modes with L0, with zero OM, will have this uh, double peak ring shape structure. Okay, so now we see that uh, nonlinear C11 interferometers have a lot of interesting properties and they can be used for um, radiation shaping and so on. And then arising the question how we can bring this information and our knowledge to the integrated platforms. So in principle, why we are interested in the integrated platforms, because um, so integrated platforms, that's the future in principle. Yeah? So they have fairly small size, several centimeters. They have high stability and high efficiency. And in principle, all elements, uh, which we know in bulk optics can be easily implemented into different integrated platforms. Yeah? So including uh, integrated PDC sources, including uh, nanowire single, photon detectors, including phase modulator, beam splitters, polarization converters, and so on. And in principle, um, using, for example, lithium niobate platform, uh, we recently shown, showed that um, it is possible to implement linear Mach center interferometer and using uh, excellent electro optics of lithium niobate uh, with different polarization converters, we can manipulate the properties of lithium niobate uh, of Mach center interferometer. Yes, yeah, so, and this is why I need a question how we can implement uh, properties of SU11 interferometers into the integrated platforms. And to do so, first of all, um, we consider the conventional architecture of SU11 interferometer and just bring it to the um, integrated platform. Yeah, so, let's consider our uh, type 2 PDC process because that's the high efficiency process in the considered material. And first of all, let's consider the conventional architecture. So in our integrated case, the conventional architecture consists of two nonlinear media. Yeah, so that means that that's just uh, KTP with the periodic pooling and a linear propagation distance in between. Yeah, so that's the same material, but without uh, this periodic pooling. And then uh, phase modulation, we can bring with uh, electro optics. We just apply the voltage and change the uh, refractive index profile and bring some phase. Okay, if we do so, and if we look on the joint spectral intensity in the end, what we can see for different phases. In principle, we see nothing interesting in point that for each phase from zero to pi, in the end, we will see some interference structure. So why that's happened? In principle, when we apply some phase here to our really broadband light, it means for each spectral component, we bring some its own phase. And finally, when this light with its each own phase for each spectral component go to the second PDC, there is some interference happened here, yeah, so nonlinear interference happened in the second PDC. And finally, we see how we see 
some kind of modulations of intensity. But we don't have any phase for which we can obtain the full amplification or the amplification of the intensity. And as we know, and I will talk about it a bit later uh, about it, um, to obtain perfect phase sensitivity, which can overcome the short noise limit, we shall obtain um, configurations where we have more or less perfect destructive interference. Okay, so this is why uh, when we go to the integrated structures, we have the main problem, and that's the dispersion of the material. Yeah, so as okay, I talked before, we consider this type 2 PDC process because it's the most efficiency process in uh, our structure. And here in the dispersive material, we have problem. Yeah, so our two photons have different polarizations, and this is why they have different group velocities, and then they have some time delay when they leave the structure, when they leave the crystal. This means that we should think how to compensate this time delay. And the solution that's using a polarization converter somewhere in between of our device. And second question, that's the second order effects. Yeah, so when we uh, provide some compensations here, we compensate the first order effects, but we cannot do anything with the second order effects, which is uh, proportional, which is scaled as a frequency squared. But what we can do in principle, we can just eliminate, we can just diminish a bit these effects. And for this reason, we will need the CW pulse laser. Okay, so in principle, that's our integrated architecture of SU11 interferometer, which again consists of two periodically pulsed regions uh, where a nonlinear process has happened, linear material in between. Phase modulation with electro optics polarization converter in the middle to compensate this um, time delay between horizontally and vertically polarized photons. And we will use also a CW pump laser. So now the question why we need this CW pump laser. And to understand this, let's look on the joint spectral amplitude. Now, so the joint spectral amplitude consists of two functions. The first one that's function which is connected with the uh, uh, properties of our laser and tau that's a pulse duration of our laser. And second function that's a phase matching function which is connected with the properties of our material and that's complicated to um, manipulate by this uh, phase matching function uh, in chosen material in configuration. And finally, we can construct this joint spectral intensity as an overlapping between these two functions. And in principle, what we can see now, so when we look at the phase matching function for, let's say, a perfect destructive interference case where we apply phase equals to pi, we see that, yeah, in the middle we have some minimum of the intensity, but we have some side lobes, uh, um, side lobes peaks. But uh, using an appropriate pump, we can, in principle, um, diminish this intensity from the in the joint spectral intensity. And how we can do it? By using the CW laser. Yeah? So when we increase the pulse duration, it means that we decrease the width of our um, pump function distribution. And then instead of um, joint spectral intensity with this form in the case of a pulse laser, in the CW case, we will just cut the central region where we have a very small amount of photons. And we see that here the number of photons is really very close to zero. Okay, so now uh, when we will plot the mean photon number in relation to the phase, in two cases for pulse laser and for CW laser, we really see this difference. Yeah? So for example, when we have pulse laser, we have some residual number of photons. And even for phase equals to pi, we cannot achieve the perfect destructive interference. That's not the case uh, for a CW laser, and yeah, so where we can be very close to the zero. And that's important. That's important why? Because when we look at the formula of the phase sensitivity, we see that that's a difference, that's a relation between the photon number variance and the derivative of number of photons in relation to the phase. 
Yeah, so and this derivative uh, we see here, yeah, we see that in that point derivative will be exactly equals to zero. And then if uh, our delta n is not zero, we will obtain like in a something over zero. Yeah, so which is infinity, which is bad. And for squeezed states of light, which generated in S11 interferometer, we know that such kind of states have very broad photon number distributions. And this is why to obtain the regions where we can observe the phase sensitivity below the shot noise limit, we should model a situation where we, ha we have in the denominator and denominator some kind of zero. And then we will have these dark fringes of interferometer where the phase sensitivity is possible. Yeah, so then we say that this is our phase sensitivity regions. And then if we will calculate the phase sensitivity in respect to the phase and respect to the uh, gain of the process, we see that we can really with our configuration, with our um, integrated configuration of s human interferometer, achieve some phase sensitivity regions below the short noise limit. But when we increase the gain of the process, this phase sensitivity destroyed. And the reason why, because uh, we have compensation only until the first order uh, included. And we have non-compensated second order effects. When we increase the gain, we increase the influence of the second order effects, and that's why we destroy our phase sensitivity. But then the question, okay, so what we can do here? Uh, how we can increase the phase sensitivity and native answer that's let's use filtering. Yeah, so for example, that's um, transpectral intensity without a filter and with a, with a small filter. Yeah? So with some small narrowband filter. At first glance, uh, this filter just do nothing. Yeah? So probably, I don't know, do you see something here or not, but there are some very, very small uh, side lobes of the sync function. Yeah, so in principle here, our filter just cut this uh, very small, very tiny, yeah, so intensity of photons. But you know, when you look at the phase sensitivity, it is crucial. Yeah, so you can see that, for example, here, yeah, so that's our phase sensitivity region. And even when we cut this very small amount of transpectral intensity, we can really obtain improvement in the phase sensitivity respect to the case without a filter. Okay, next question. Yeah, so in bulk optics, we know that if we use some kind of seeds, we can also increase the phase sensitivity. Yeah, so then let's do the same in our integrated case. And what we can do, yeah, so of course we can consider different seeding, yeah, so different states can be used as a seed. And of course we can use different uh, detection strategy, like in a direct detection or homodyne detection. So first of all, let's consider just a single photon in the first Schmidt mode, and let's see what we have in the phase sensitivity. So this is the minimum points of the phase sensitivity, minimum values of the phase sensitivity for each gain, in the case with a single photon seed and without a seed. So, what we can see, yeah, so when we have sufficiently high gains, uh, our two curves just a coincide. And in principle, that's clear because uh, for these gains, uh, influence of single photon, just nothing. Yeah? So uh, we, we generate a lot of photons and this is why the single photon seed, so system is not sensitive for this single photon seed for these gains. But what's interesting and surprising, yeah? so when we're looking to the small amount, small gains, we see even the worsening of the phase sensitivity. Yeah, so that's a question. Okay, so probably that's not an optimal case. Yeah, so let's go further. Let's consider another um, seed. Yeah, so like, like in a strong coherent seed in a plane wave mode. And let's use even different uh, detection strategy. Yeah, so for example, the homodyne detection. And let's look on the same curve, but in this case. And what we see, we see again nothing. Yeah, so we see just worsening of the phase sensitivity. And then question why? And in principle, the answer that when we use some kind of seed in a signal mode alone, so this seed destroy the phase sensitivity 
And why? Because it creates some kind of imbalance between the number of signals and other photons generated. And as you remember, in our case, we use a CW laser yeah, so to, to observe in principle the phase sensitivity. And this CW laser creates a strong single signal other photon correlations. And when we add some seed only in a signal beam, we just destroy the signal other photon correlations. And this is why we uh, don't observe, do not observe this phase sensitivity at all. And what's a solution? Solution just to uh, use a seed in both arms, and that's what in principle we are currently doing. Okay, so, but now let's go further and let's consider how anisotropy effects in SU11 can give us some um, useful tools and structures. So, first of all, as I told before about uh, orbital angular momentum modes, um, if we have some kind of cylindrical symmetry in our SU11, we can generate um, ring shaped structure, orbital angular momentum, and so on. But in principle, in reality, we have a walk-off. Yeah? So due, due to the biofringent properties of our materials, we have a walk-off inside the single crystal. And what people usually do, they try to compensate this walk-off just using the second crystal with an opposite orientation of optical axis. And then, yeah, so we can, if our crystal is not so thick, we can create some kind of cylindrical symmetry. But in principle, we can also think what non-compensated configuration can, um, can do for us. Okay, so first of all, let's see what we have in the compensated configuration. So in the compensated configuration, if our crystal is not so thick, yeah, so we create this cylindrical symmetry, then we can observe this ring-shaped structure. We see some peaks in the Schmidt number and simultaneously the minimum in the intensity distribution. Distribution, yeah, so that's our perfect points where we can create very pro distribution of the orbital angular momentum modes. But then when we increase the length of the crystals, uh, we increase the influence of anisotropy. We see that this uh, compensation does not work properly anymore. And simultaneously, we see that we start to increase the number of Schmidt modes in the system. Okay, so what we can say about non-compensated configuration. In non-compensated configuration, the situation is completely different. Yeah, so first of all, we start with an um, increased number of moles. Yeah, so it means that just we change the orientation of the crystal here from one to another, and we see that we have increased the number of moles in fourth times in the non-compensated case. And secondly, we see that in the non-compensated configuration, the distance plays a crucial role. Yeah? So when we start to increase distance slightly, the number of modes reduces very fast. And simultaneously, the opposite effect in the intensity happened. Yeah? So in the intensity, that's the integral number of photons, we see that at some distance, we have some kind of amplification at three orders of magnitude. Yeah, so this amplification is connected with the next overlapping of the generated signal photons here with the pump. Yeah, so when we consider just configuration without an air gap, these photons we generated here, due to the walk-off effect, will be at some point not um, intersect with the pump and will just leave the crystal, yeah, so without any further amplification. But when we add some air gap, we change the um, direction of propagation of photon here. Yeah? And this is why this photon can again overlap in the second crystal, which rise, which give us this amplification in three order of magnitude. And then when we just increase the length of the crystals, we increase the influence of the anisotropy effect. We see that scaling of uh, increasing length twice uh, leads to the shift of this distance twice. Yeah, so and the anisotropy effects becomes more clear. Okay, so let's consider this uh, complicated situation a bit in more details. Yeah? So we can look at different distances. Yeah? So for example, first of all, let's look on this distance where we have this changing in the number of modes and in the intensity. 
Yeah, so that's some critical distance where our peak, peaks start to separate it. Yeah, so for example, when we look on the correlation function in the low gain regime, that's not so interesting. Yeah, so that's just a single peak. But in the high gain regime for this distance, we already see some separation in the intensity distribution between two peaks. And also this visible in the correlation function. Then we go further and we go to our special point where we have amplification in intensity in three order of magnitude. And here in the high gain regime, we see the perfectly separated peaks with a Schmidt number equals to two. It means that we create two separated, highly correlated moles. Yeah? So we say that that's a twin beam generation. And this twin beam generation is possible only in the high gain regime. Yeah? So we can see that in the low gain regime, even with the distance, even with anisotropy, we don't have this effect. And finally, when we go further, when we increase distance further, uh, our system tends to the single mode regime because the last part of the radiation um, intersect with the pump in the second crystal. Yeah, so and we see this tendency to the single mode case. Okay, yeah, so and again, this generation of correlated twin beams, yeah, so that's possible only in the high gain regime and that's completely impossible with the low intensity in the low intensity regime. So finally, now what we can do with uh, what we can do further, yeah, so with, with such kind of configurations, we can play with the radiation shaping. So we have two different configurations with a compensated and non-compensated anisotropy. And in principle, we have two different effects. The first one that's broadening of the intensity distribution with increasing gain. So for example, we can see it here. Yeah, so when we go from the uh, blue to the orange line, we increase the gain and we have the broadening of the intensity distribution. And the second effect, that's a narrowing of intensity distribution when we add a distance. Yeah, so from uh, here to here, we increase the distance and um, distance leads to the narrowing of the intensity distribution. So it means that at some point, these two effects should somehow compensate each other. Yeah, so it, we really see this point. So for example, here you can see that uh, you increase gain and you reduce the number of modes, but simultaneously the shape of the intensity uh, is more or less stable. Yeah, so we have more or less stable and constant shape. And to the, for the configuration with a non-compensated anisotropy, we have another interesting and special point, and that's point which we discussed already before. And that's point where we can generate, again, in the high gain regime, to correlate, especially separated twin beams. Yeah, so with the strong correlations. But of course, one can play with these parameters and one can create different interference pattern with the, um, separated or not separated beams and so on. Okay, so then uh, I will stop with this part and uh, last, I don't know, seven minutes probably, I will spend into the part of interaction of um, such kind of light, squeezed light, which can be generated in NC11 and interaction of such kind of light with uh, atomic systems. Yeah, so here we consider three level system, uh, which and um, shine these two level systems, the three level systems with two light fields, which can have different intensity distributions. Yeah? So for example, that can be coherent light or that can be a squeezed light, yeah? so which generated in the S11 interferometers. So, and then our Hamiltonian consists of uh, atomic part, field part and the interaction part. And when we are looking uh, to the uh, probability to the population of the third level, we see that uh, dependence on the field statistics will have different structure. Yeah, so when uh, we have, for example, coherent state, then we have a typical picture with the collapses and revivals, collapses and revivals and so on. But when we have a squeezed light with a broad intensity distribution, then we don't have this yeah, so picture of collapses and revivals. We have more or less chaotic structure um, yeah, so and that's which in principle connected with this very, very broad uh, distribution in the case of a squeezed vacuum. So now we can investigate different effects, which we know from the um, semi-classical physics, but with using a quantum light. And one of them that's electromagnetically induced transparency. 
Yeah, so the electromagnetic induced transparency happens when we shine our three-level system with two lights. And one of them is in the uh, resonance with the third level. And then such kind of destructive interference happened and our system becomes transparent to the probe light. Yeah, so uh, instead of absorption, we have just a transparency. And then when we look at the population of the third level, so we can see the typical electromagnetically induced transparency curves. Yeah, so for example, when we look at the region of a middle uh, zero of detunings, when we have this resonance and destructive interference, we see that our system is really transparent to the probe light and we observe them induced electromagnetically induced transparency effect. But depending on the statistics of our quantum field, we will observe different structure. Yeah, so for example, this typical double peak structure that's uh, even the situation which you can obtain in the case of a classical field in the semi-classical approach and picture. But when we are using the quantum light, the squeezed light, we see that the shape is completely different. And in principle, the coupling field determines the shape and profile of the light. And of course, the position of the peaks and the structure is also dependent on the light, quantum light, the statistics of quantum light, which we apply. And um, yeah, so what we can add more, yeah, so if, for example, we compare this uh, blue and orange curves, yeah, so that's uh, light with the same coupling field, but a different probe field. Yeah, so when we add a squeezed light instead of a coherent light, we see the improvement, yeah, so slightly improvement in the electromagnetically induced transparency. It means that uh, using a um, special quantum light, yeah, so can even increase this phenomenon known, improve this phenomenon known for the uh, semi-classical picture. So, and finally, um, what also where we should be very careful, that's the response of the system uh, in the incoming light field. Yeah, so the response of the system, that's a polarization. And when, for example, we uh, look at the polarization, when we look at the interaction of quantum light fields with the atomic system and calculate the classical polarization, yeah, so which is presented here, we can see that for squeezed vacuum light, this polarization is exactly zero. Yeah, so that's connected with, again, this specific distribution of for photo number statistics for uh, squeezed light, light, where we have populated only even number of photons. Yeah, so this is why when we have, when we absorb our system, absorb one photon, yeah, so we um, have even what number of photons in the system, yeah, so and these elements, they will be just exactly equals to zero. What does it mean? It means that when we are dealing with a quantum light, we have to be very careful about the um, quantities which we are taking into account. Yeah, so for example, we see that the classical polarization gives a wrong answer. Yeah, so we have some field, quantum field, we have some dynamics, but response just zero. Yeah, so in this case, we should use a quantum polarization and we should think about introduction and new measurement, more um, careful and appropriate measurement for them, studying interaction of quantum light with uh, uh, atomic systems. And in this case, yeah, we see really that um, we have non-zero response and such kind of quantity can uh, very well describe our system. Okay, so with this, I would like to summarize and go to the end. So today we uh, we talk about nonlinear interferometry. Yeah, so we discuss special temporal and uh, frequency properties of SC11 interferometers. Uh, we uh, discuss a bit anisotropy effects and generation of twin beam in the high gain regime in the SC11 interferometers. We discuss the integrated versions of the SU11 and the phase sensitivity, which we can obtain here. And also we uh, talk about a, a little bit about interaction of atomic system with the quantum light and phenomena, which we can observe here. So finally, I would like to thank all people who are uh, involved in this work. That's uh, my PhD students, Alessandro Ferreri, uh, who's working with integrated SU11 
That's Matvei Rebinin, who's working with anisotropy effects in SV11. That's the Henry Kruse, who's working with uh, atom quantum light interaction. That's our experimental colleagues from group of Christine Zilberhorn, that's Fahid Ansari, Kai Honglu, Benjamin Andrecht. Uh, of course, the previous experiment was done in the Marshall group and uh, um, uh, people from her group, like Anna Matiema and so, um, Samuel Lemia and so on. And of course, uh, Olga Tikhonova and Torsten Meyer, uh, with whom we have our joint uh, um, the FGA RSF project. Yeah, also many thanks. Okay, so with this, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention and welcome to the question. Thank you so much. Um, colleagues, I think we may switch to Russian because the non-Russian speaking participant uh, is disconnected. <laughs> um, so, пожалуйста, коллеги, вопросы. Так, ну, давайте для начала я задам вопрос. Конечно, я нашел, кого спрашивать, да, сейчас буду спрашивать. А, Сергей Павлович, у вас вопрос? А, нет, ну ладно. Нет. А, да, <laughs> хорошо. А, спрашивать у теоретика про, эксперимент, про детали эксперимента, наверное, не очень уместно, но я попробую. А, вот, вот там, где была схема интегрального вот этого чипа, а, и там вот была фаза и изменение поляризации, можете показать слайд? Mm -hmm. Так, сейчас попробуем переключиться. Вот этот, да? А, ну, вот даже вот следующий, наверное. Ага, ага. А, ну да, все. Вот, а, а, то есть там сигнальные холостой фотоны, сигнальные, сигнальные холостая волна, они отличались по, по пространству, правильно, да? То есть вот сейчас, если, если предыдущий слайд включить. Я, я, okay, вопрос, вопрос вот в чем был, да, как, каким образом отдельно фаза наводилась на одну поляризационную моду, но не на другую, да, потому что вот фазовая модуляция была обозначена, что она только на одну волну действует, да, и как, собственно, делалось вот преобразование поляризации? А, ну, в общем, поляризация – это тоже электрооптика, то есть вот все, что на литиуме Абате, это электрооптика, вот, например, вот здесь хороший экспериментальный пример, да, то есть вот здесь, например, есть ряд поляризационных конвертеров, каждый из которых включается при помощи приложения напряжения, и таким образом изменяется поляризация в какой-то определенной точке. Да, и таким образом можно как раз варьировать вот эту временную задержку в зависимости от того, в какой точке приложить это напряжение, раньше или позже, и вот временная задержка будет компенсироваться. Mm -hmm. По поводу фазы, на самом деле, да, Здесь они распространяются одновременно, сигнальный и холостой, но у них разная поляризация. За счет того, что у них разная поляризация, то есть вот как раз можно внести фазу только в один из них. Угу. Понятно. И в накачку она тоже не вносится, получается? То есть она в накачку только... она не вносится, да. Накачка угу. здесь, в принципе, может даже идти по другому пути. Угу. Угу. Понятно, спасибо. Коллеги, еще вопросы? А, Ранжит, пожалуйста. Спасибо, Константин. Спасибо за интересный доклад. Мне вопрос такой. Поясните, пожалуйста, почему вы не рассматриваете дифракцию и ее влияние на число фотонов и корреляцию в, ну, в обычных кристаллах и периодических структурах интенсивность и корреляция сильно зависит от дифракции, то есть внутри кристалла присутствует дифракция. У вас, ну, почему вы не рассматриваете, может быть, есть какие-то причины? Дефракцию, какую именно вы имеете в виду, да? значит, mm -hmm. давайте начнем с того, что если, если мы рассматриваем балк интерферометры, которые были изначально, да, не интегрированные, mm -hmm. а просто mm -hmm. на кристаллах, то там, как правило, кристаллы тонкие, и как бы о каких-то там эффектах уширение mm -hmm. и так далее внутри, в тонких кристаллах, и там этим просто пренебрегается. Но а, когда добавляется расстояние в воздухе, да, естественно, вот эту дифракцию в воздухе мы учитываем. 
в том плане, что э, параметрика, естественно, расходится да, за счет того, что вот у нее широкое распределение по углу. Когда добавляется расстояние между кристаллами, то, естественно, э, свет параметрики расходится. И ну, вот сейчас я переключу какую-нибудь картинку, где это видно. Вот, вот здесь вот это видно. Да, то есть вот параметрика расходится, естественно, во втором кристалле с накачкой пересекается только какая-то ее часть. И это, естественно, во всех формулах зашито. И это как раз приводит к тому, что интенсивность по мере увеличения расстояния сужается. Да, то есть и вот как раз мы говорим о сужении да, интенсивности с увеличением расстояния. А что касается интегрированных схем, то здесь... Понятное дело, волноводы. И здесь вообще одна пространственная мода. Да, то есть здесь существенно спектрально многомодовый случай, но а, мода пространственная одна, и да, вот здесь этим тоже можно всем пренебречь. Uh -huh, uh -huh. А когда вы говорите пренебрегайте, то это речь идет о каких длин кристалла? Um... Если это балк оптика, то длина кристалла – это миллиметр, три миллиметра от силы. Mm -hmm. То есть если уже больше, вот в эффектах анизотропии, да, например, вот здесь были длины mm -hmm. кристаллов, вот уже 0,25-0,5, и видим, что здесь уже все портится на самом деле. То есть mm -hmm. типичный mm -hmm. диапазон – это 1-3 ну, миллиметра максимум. В интегрированных, mm -hmm. конечно, больше. То есть в интегрированных все на самом деле сложнее в том плане, что… Где они? Вот они. Здесь пока все делается с низкими интенсивностями, да, то есть это не яркие сжатые состояния здесь ни в коем случае. Здесь режим нескольких фотонов, фотонной пары. И для того, чтобы получить более или менее хорошую эффективность, да, нам нужно, естественно, выбрать по длине вот в секцию PDC. И здесь она ну, 1-2 сантиметра. Но 2 сантиметра это уже совсем предел, конечно. Спасибо. Спасибо. Хорошо. А, Денис, пожалуйста. У меня вопрос один, который, собственно, вдогонку к предыдущему а, вопросу. То есть есть утверждение, что зашиты в формулах, да, дифракция, а вот дифракция накачки, я так понимаю, не учитывается. Ну, конечно, да. Дифракция накачки не учитывается, считается, я опять вернусь вот к этой прекрасной картинке, да, а здесь накачка считается постоянной, ну, как в эксперименте, я думаю, это не мне объяснять экспериментаторам, да, что вот ну, в эксперименте, наоборот, перетяжка делается где-нибудь в центре, да, на минимальный, минимальный размер пучка, но в, в теории, естественно, да, накачка пока что здесь постоянная. Там же какая-нибудь фазовые дополнительные набеги будут, да, связанные с ГУИ и так далее, и так далее. ГУИ фаза, да, 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 ну, конечно, да, то есть дальше можно добавлять вот эти все вещи, вот. добавлять да, сюда. Да. А да. второй вопрос, собственно, по расчету, потому что как, как считается это, потому что должны быть какие-то критерии, да, вот по правильности расчета, на то, что вот сходится, это численное решение этого интегродифференциального уравнения страшного. Угу. Это вот как-то проверяется? Да, ну, во-первых, в жизни как бы главный критерий это эксперимент, скажем так, сходится с экспериментом, хорошо описывает. А, ну, во-первых, естественно, есть всегда предел низкого гейна. Да? В низком гейне все хорошо сделано, в низком гейне прекрасная аналитика с модами Да, 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 в низком гейне я вот, вопросов нет. Угу. А вот. Вот большим как проверять? То есть понятно, что проверяется, например, условия Боголюбова, да, на угу. вот эти вот функции, это первое, что должно быть, да, но с другой стороны, вот никто же не сказал, что это будет вот корректный расчет целиком и полностью. Вот. А, ну, есть? всегда, Нет? опять же, есть какие-то вещи, которые, ну, вот, например, есть одномодовый режим, да, то есть можно всегда уйти в одномодовый режим и как бы интегродифференциальное уравнение да, в одномодовом режиме, в режиме плоской волны, они опять же сводятся к аналитике. Да? Плоском они распадаются, да, просто на дифференциальное уравнение. Да, 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 вот то, что Давай. у Пушко написано и так далее. То есть вот, есть да, критерий да. здесь, например, да, уйти в плоскую волну и как бы вот сравнить многомодный как бы, вот этот случай из численного решения с аналитикой, которая известна. Ладно, спасибо. Спасибо. Коллеги, еще вопросы? К 
комментарии, пожелания. Константин, могу задать еще вопрос? Да, давайте. Спасибо. Полина, скажите, скажите просто, вот, когда вы говорите «гейн», то э, в моем понимании это нелинейный коэффициент и умножается на, э, на что-то что еще, да? Э, да. Ага. Значит, в общей сложности, да, когда мы говорим, ну, мы немного разделяем понятие теоретического и экспериментального гейна, э, Теоретический гейн – это просто в нашем понимании константа, которая стоит в гамильтониане. Да? У нее там входит mm -hmm. квадратичная нелинейность, амплитуды полей ну вот, и так далее. И так далее. Mm -hmm. Когда мы уже описываем полный процесс, мы говорим об экспериментальном гейне, куда входит, mm -hmm. естественно, интенсивность накачки, мощность, mm -hmm. длина кристалла, которая также влияет да, на вот эту вещь. Ну и, естественно, все предыдущие константы. Mm -hmm. А вот то, что вы... Э на слайде у вас было 1-2 значения гена. Это означает, что с помощью этого я могу выбрать длину кристалла? Или это, что, что это означает? Вот 1, 2, 3. А где, где, на каком слайде? У вас в каком-то слайде были цифры, когда ген у вас, ну, значения гена варьировались. Вот. Вот. Ну, такие же были рисунки, но снизу была, по-моему, ген. Вот. И когда один, то что это? Вот здесь вот. Да, вот, да, да, 2, 4, 6, 8. Вот. Да, значит... а, как физически трактовать mm -hmm. вот это? Это длина кристалла или что? На... Не совсем. То есть длина кристалла, конечно, туда входит. Здесь длина кристалла фиксирована, и здесь увеличивается мощность накачки, да, чтобы увеличить этот гейм. А чтобы понять, как соотнести все это с числами фотонов. Но, грубо говоря, число фотонов – это синус гиперболический от гейна в квадрате. Ну так, это вот, вот в одномодовом приближении, да, грубо говоря, на пальцах. Да, то есть, чтобы посмотреть, например, ну вот сколько фотонов будет для гейна шестерки, вот возьмем гиперболический синус, ну или даже экспонент, да, шестерка в квадрате, получим число фотонов. Mm -hmm. То есть это численные расчеты у вас? Это численно, да. То есть эксперимент mm -hmm. сейчас вот с этим интегрированным интерферометром, ну все понимают, что эксперимент дело долгое, Спасибо. Особенно с интегрированными, и поэтому это в процессе. То есть мы надеемся, что наши экспериментаторы нас обрадуют очень скоро. Спасибо. Спасибо. Ну что, коллеги, я понимаю, что больше вопросов нет. Комментарии, пожелания. Ну, хорошо, тогда, тогда на этом давайте поблагодарим Полину за интересный доклад. Да, в общем, желаем дальнейших успехов вот, и ждем на следующих семинарах с новыми результатами. Спасибо. Спасибо. И дальнейших спасибо. успехов этому семинару. Спасибо. 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 Большое спасибо. Большое спасибо, Полина. Всего доброго. Ждем.